So I guess we should get started. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, my name is Alina Fennell, um, and I will let um, our host and my co-facilitator um, introduce themselves. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I can't see you, but I feel you here. I'm glad you're here for this conversation. <laughs> um, my name is Claire Wildhack Nolan, and I'm a facilitator with the Peace Learning Center, and I've been here for about nine years facilitating and coordinating. Um, and prior to that, I was a middle school and high school social studies and humanities teacher here and in Chicago. Um, grew up in Indiana, Bloomington, and Indianapolis, and I'm really excited to be um, a part of this community and neighborhood power, been a huge fan of INRC and public allies for a long time. Um, and it's always interesting to be a part of community, right? Lately, I've just been really, really appreciative and recognizing how integral survival is, is to community. Um, so um, thanks so much for having us and I'll pass it back to Alina. Yeah. Cool. I will just take two seconds to introduce myself. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mackenzie Isaac, but friends call me Kinsey. So please feel free to call me Kinsey. I am a part of the current cohort of AmeriCorps Public Allies, just like Alina, and I'm placed with Health by Design. And I have the incredible privilege of being the host of tonight's session, creating space for critical conversations. And soon I will give the floor fully to Alina and Claire so that they can share their insight and expertise. I know that they have a few housekeeping items that are specific to their presentation, um, but in general, in um, streamlining how we interact with this space, I wanted to direct you guys to uh, the panel on the right-hand side of your screen right now. You should see chat. You should see Q&A. Um, so please feel free to interact with one another in the chat. Um, you can also personally message um, any participants if you guys want to exchange thoughts or notes. If you have any lingering questions that aren't directly addressed um, through your interaction um, with this presentation or through the presentation itself, then please feel free to type those in the Q&A at the same question as someone else and you can kind of echo their sentiment by clicking on that question um, and the more clicks that a particular question gets the more that, that question floats to the top of my screen and that will determine the order in which we have our Q&A which will be a full 15 minutes at the end of this beginning at around 7 45. So um, without further ado I yield the floor to the wonderful Alina and Claire and thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Kinsey. Um, welcome to everybody here. I'm so glad that you're able to attend this talk of um, creating space for critical conversations. My name's Lena, Claire has introduced herself, um, and I am a program facilitator at Peace Learning Center as a part of my AmeriCorps term. So before we really get into the content for today, we have a couple of housekeeping things. One is just like technology ground rules. Um, I have never <laughs> used Remo before. Um, so these are just a few things that will be able to help you. Um, chat is located on the right side of your screen. If you would like to speak verbally, please put an I in the chat. Um, and if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Um, and also we will utilize the Q&A tool during the last 15 minutes. Um, so if you have any questions during um, the presentation, like just um, shoot it into the general chat and we will make sure to keep an eye out on that to answer your questions. So objectives I find to be one of the most important parts of our trainings. And I think this really sets um, the goals for what we would like to achieve through today's training. And so our objectives for creating space for critical conversations is to empower attendees with skills necessary to have challenging conversations with friends, loved ones, and community members around issues of values-based importance and identity. We also wanna practice interrupting bias or hate language and we want to create an opportunity for practice and self-reflection. So hopefully, as you enter this space, you are able to have um, the handout um, that goes along with this training. Um, if not, please let us know, and I will be able to put that in the chat for everyone. Um, so this is what we're going to achieve today. 
So we're together um, from now until eight. And so we will go over a short intro and welcome as well as connections. We'll talk about barriers and help for challenging conversations. And lastly, we'll go over addressing hate language and identity-based bias in conversation. So before we really get started, please grab a drink, a snack, or anything you need to be comfortable during today's training. Um, we just want you to be in a great space um, for us to have these really um, important conversations. So one thing that we like to do before we enter any space um, where we discuss important topics such as identity and um, values-based importance, um, we would like to set ground rules on how we treat each other during this conversation. Um, so we have listen to understand, um, speak from the heart, right to pass if you don't want to talk you please do not feel the pressure to and do not use hate language or slurs even if report uh repeating a story so those are just a couple of the ground rules that we have as we enter this space um and now i will pass it off to my co-facilitator claire all right hi everybody um so whenever we work with community, we are recognize that people are coming with their own personal experience to the table. And we want to honor that as well as really connect today and what we are gonna be getting into to how it, it is relevant to you um, and being aware of what you're hoping to kind of get out of the day. So um, there are, I think about 14 of us here today. I can't see anyone but Alina. So I'm wondering if we can go ahead and stop share and we're gonna talk, try to meet a couple people. And I'm just curious, um, why did you choose this topic to come to? Basically, what is interesting to you about the subject? Um, and, or you can go ahead and put your answer also in the chat. So it'd be great to hear from some people. Um, if you put an I in the chat, that lets me know that you'd be willing to share verbally and we could actually hear from your voice. So go ahead and either put an I in the chat or you can write yours. And we'll be able to probably time-wise have enough time for about three, three or four people to share out why this topic, why is it interesting and needed for you in the work you do. Is there? Is there anyone there? Or do you see anything in the chat? <laughs> Is it just us? I don't think it's just us. But, okay. Um, if All right, well, we... <laughs> Yay, um, someone answered. Thank you, Beth. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Um, to learn more, okay? Just to learn more about having hard conversations. We have a couple people um, who are here. Oh, yay, here comes everything. Ooh. Um, someone bringing up um, social emotional work is mm -hmm. important to be able to talk about tough topics to make sure addressing root causes and not just slapping a Band-Aid on things. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate um, Sherry Fennell. Um, we're, we're finally at a place in our nation's history where it seems a larger number of people are engaged in understanding these issues. So really mm -hmm. trying to keep that momentum up and keep people talking. Great, thank you all for, for putting your thoughts in the chat, we really appreciate it. And we will be to continually trying to engage in dialogue as a practice of this topic. Um, we are gonna make try to make this a space for a critical conversation, as well as just learning some tips. It is important that um, everyone who's here can participate on some level. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much um, for being able, willing to use the chat. Um, or even it, it looks like maybe if you share your screen, we'd be able to actually see you as well. So if you are able and can share your screen, that always helps, helps us build a richer connection and create a better space for having these conversations. Um, and that's an interesting tip too, because some of us, these are the spaces now that we are having, <laughs> having these conversations that can be really important to us based on our values, our identity, our experiences, our families, um, and our work. So thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. So now we're going to have um, 
a little bit of reflection. So these are about um, asking about times where conversations didn't go so well. So what do you think caused those challenges um, in those conversations? And then on the flip side, um, conversations that did go well, um, what were some of the key characteristics that made the conversation go well? Um, so if you can populate the chat, we would love to hear your experiences and reflections. Um, and while people do that, Claire and I can share um, about one of the conversations that either didn't go so well or went well. I know for me, I'm always complicated because it's always a mixed bag. <laughs> like the same conversation has like moments of going really well and then it can have moments that didn't really go well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, one thing that I notice is, you know, a conversation maybe will pop up with someone I'm just hanging out with around, you know, like maybe at a party even or around the lunch table um, in a workspace or something like that where I'll feel like I'm on the same page with someone and then a comment will be made that I'm like, wow, oh, to me that was, you know, problematic or hurtful or like I'm really um, surprised at potentially an ignorance or the way something is said feels like it's um, prejudice in some kind of way, perhaps is a good way to put it. And then I try to move forward with that conversation and and complicate it and have a good discussion around like what maybe came up for me around that and maybe educate a little bit. And then sometimes I get heated, really heated, and I get more upset. I start turning red mm -hmm. and, then, and then I have to, um, and, and I'm to a place, if it's someone I know well, where like I could be um, speaking to them in ways that are maybe disrespectful because I'm so frustrated, especially if they're not really open to hearing what I have to say or my perspective. Um, and so then what I've found then is it doesn't go very far if we're both just trying to argue and getting frustrated with each other. So what's helped those conversations go better for me is when I have some space and then both of us are willing to engage um, when we're not, when we've had a chance to mull over the original thoughts and the original comments and come, if we're brave enough to come back to it and revisit it after some calming down and uh, self-reflection kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about? yeah, I think that's a, a good one. Um, and what Brooke um, put in the chat, I can definitely relate to because I feel that a lot of times I get overwhelmed. And when I get overwhelmed, I start to cry, even though I'm not necessarily like sad in that moment, but there's just like a lot going on. Um, but a conversation that went well for me um, is one where um, that I had with my dad, um, where we just we're not able to read each other's tones over text. And so that led us to have not necessarily an argument, but a disagreement um, around if he was gonna pick me up um, from my mom's house <laughs> or not. And so a lot of that came from just not being able to read each other's tone um, and misconstruing in, uh, intentions when entering the conversation. And so we ended up like calling each other um, and that was, helped us to be able to clear up a lot of the misconceptions that we had about mm -hmm. each person's position as they entered that conversation. And then from there, we realized, okay, if we have something that we feel like we should talk about and sort of clear up, we should probably call each other instead of text because it's just not that easy for us to be able to like gleam um, tone just from the words on our phones. Oh, yeah. So that was one that went well. I totally overuse emojis all the time because I don't know how to express tone in, email. I'm trying to not do that in my emails, but in my text, because that is a huge thing. I don't know how it could be coming across. And it's the assumptions. I think there's a lot of space for assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that often doesn't help. <laughs> no, I, I definitely agree. I probably overuse exclamation marks in not only my text, but my emails, because I want to sound happy and excited. <laughs> right. And then I, I heard a story where my, um, my cousin who works in a school, she was sending emails to parents and the parents thought she was yelling at them. Mm. She was using a lot of exclamation points. They took her tone as yelling mm. and like being, being like, you knew ner, ner you know, and she just meant like, hey. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's confusing. And that's, 
that could be layered, you know, mm-hmm. especially with pow- power dynamics, um, like someone who's in a position of authority, um, potentially. Yeah. So thank you so much, Brooke, for sharing in the chat. And even if you didn't share, I hope you were able to have some internal reflection about conversations that did well um, and conversations that didn't go well. Because I know that when I start to think about um, each side of that coin, I'm able to really analyze patterns that happen during the conversations. And that helps me to think about things that were barriers and obstacles for conversations and things that helped, um, which we are just about (laughs) to talk about. So I'll hand it off to Claire. Awesome. So let's go ahead and just start about like, um, let's start with what's healthy, what helps. So, you know, whether you're thinking about the perspective of if someone's approaching you in conversation um, or you're trying to approach someone else in conversation about a topic that is critical to you based on, you know, values based Um, conflicts or differences are the hardest kind of problems to solve because it's at people's roots. Um, But then that connect to a lot of other issues, right? A lot of different, um, it filters out into a lot of different, um, different perspectives, points of view, information, needs. Um, And so what helps create healthy dialogue around challenging conversations for you, whether they're about you know, identity, other value-based things, um, sensitive topics, whatever that that is for you. What helps you have that that hard talk? And we're just going to brainstorm both of these. So just jump right in. I'll help to get the brain juices flowing, but I know one thing that I find to be helpful to healthy dialogue is asking questions. So. Um, a lot of times instead of sort of making assumptions and filling in those gaps, um, asking questions helps to understand another person's perspective. So I find that to be really helpful. Awesome. And um, thanks, Beth. You were mentioning trust. I think that's really huge. And I think one of the other things we think of with that a lot of time is just like before building authentic relationships, Um, It's easier to go in and have a hard conversation with someone that you have a real authentic relationship with and some of that trust built than than, um, if it's someone that, you know, you don't have that that trust or that real relationship with. Um, What else, y'all? Brooke put one in the chat. Um, Assume good intentions when it's reasonable to do so. Um, Shari also put something in the chat. Um, we all come from different backgrounds. It's important to recognize that not everyone will have the same perspective. I think both of those are um, really good. That goes along kind of with what you were saying about don't making uh, assumptions. Mm-hmm. Um, to me too, like don't assume someone's point of view or their experience and, and, and who they are gonna come forward as. Oh, great. Now the chat's hopping, Mackenzie's in there. (laughs) Plenty of time and minimal outside distractions. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Just the real logistics of when and to have a a conversation so you can be fully present in this world really matters. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, when we're on the go all the time, I know, you know, with my family or my partner too, it's like what kids are around. Mm-hmm. Maybe it needs to be a private chat mm-hmm. because sometimes things in uh, in person with people change the dynamic and change what people are willing to be transparent and vulnerable about for the conversation. Yeah, I think um, also there's a danger in being a ru- um, being in a rush during conversations that are like pretty important and center like values um, and identity because when you're in a rush, you usually um, rush to make assumptions, but also rush to say things. And a lot of times during these conversations, we really need to be mindful of the words that we say um, and the impact that they might have. One thing I always like to throw in there too is a bi- mind body awareness. Um, you know, our when we get into conversations that are hard, we might have emotional or like ang- um, emotional feelings or anxiety might come up for us. Uh, maybe we're worried that bringing this topic up could put our job on the line, or could um, maybe we're just in this situation and we're feeling, you know, kind of under attack. So when we are stressed out or afraid, our amygdala in our um, and our body 
it's like our guard dog and it prevents it, it it activates the fight flight or freeze mechanism you know so it's more likely that we're just gonna like not know what to say which is what happens to me a lot or i'm gonna want to get out of there or i'm gonna just want to argue and like it's gonna turn into a little bit of a verbal fight or something and so to calm that mechanism down breathing um really helps trying to be aware of what's going on with our body and and talk to ourselves even a little bit about whatever we need to do to calm ourselves down and i think a lot of that also it can be more activated if we're already like stressed out mm-hmm. we're not feeling very well like we're sick um or if we're hungry angry already about something else lonely or tired mm-hmm. um so those are just things that have helped me to kind of like check in with myself before I go talk to someone or if I'm thinking about maybe why that didn't go well. Um, those things are things to keep in mind. How about, I, I think there's one big one um, that's really important and maybe it'll come out during our barriers. But what is the, we're so huge at the Peace Learning Center on this one because it's the ultimate the ultimate reason that a lot of conflicts happen is because someone's really seeking something and that need isn't getting met. What do you think it is? What need is really specific and important to having a really healthy conversation? What was that? Huh? <laughs> You're right. It's listening. <laughs> so being oh, exactly got it being, right. Being heard. Beth got it. Like most conflicts, um, one of the he- the first things we can do to help uh, someone else de-escalate or help ourselves start to de-escalate or to solve a problem or to learn from another human is to just really, truly listen mm-hmm. um, and not listen, you know, like someone was saying for that, that next point to be made mm-hmm. or to get that debate going, but to really, truly create dialogue, problem solving, under- deep understanding of another person's point of view and experience is um, fully listening. And I think that goes back to someone's point about being being present too. Don't don't try to talk about something I'm upset and then get on my phone in the middle of me talking. <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> so with that being said, what are some of the barriers um, to healthy dialogue? Because sometimes that's even easier to mention. But what really upsets you when someone does it and you're trying to have a real conversation with them? I think one thing um, is knowing someone else's sort of like triggers, whether it be like words or tones that you know will make them more angry and purposefully saying that um, and escalating the argument. Um, So I feel like that's probably one of the biggest barriers um, because that's when it doesn't turn, um, it turns from a conversation to an argument um, and it becomes a huge barrier. I feel like there's some, there was a word for that that was brought up in my upbringing with sisters and brothers all the time. I mean, no, instigating is one. Someone mm-hmm. trying to instigate problems, escalating. Like, um, there's another term. I, I accidentally um, said porously ex- escalating someone, but I really meant purposely. Purposely escalating someone. What else really frustrates you? I, I know it's hard and you should. I, I know I shouldn't like, um, like everybody's tone can be interpreted differently. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's a lot of bias, implicit bias and like prejudice um, that can be, you know, stereotypes about tone. Mm-hmm. But it but there is a certain way that when someone talks to me and I, I know my bias, especially if it comes from that, um, if it if it's um, one that I interpret as condescending. Mm-hmm. I have a hard time not getting more upset and having a harder time listening. Like I want to start addressing the way I'm being talked to versus the topic at hand. Um, but I, th- I think there is something too about um, not, not being condescending to people. That's important. Yeah, I definitely agree. Well, if there's nothing else in the chat, then we can move on. Um, and this is a really important 
topic because this is about um, things that you can do while you're having these important conversations. So um, the first point really um, piggybacks off of what Claire was talking about with mindfulness and breath and just taking those deep breaths, um, allowing your heart rate to be steady um, and to just really take that time to make sure that you're in a good space. Um, and this also connects with self-awareness. Are you hungry? Are you already emotional entering this conversation? Um, what is your body telling you? Um, and maybe it's telling you that this might not be the best time to have this conversation. Um, we all know the word hangry. Um, when I'm hangry, <laughs> it's probably best not to have um, important talks with me because I am just on one track to food. Um, be aware of emotional, physical state, um, escalators and blind spots. So these are areas where you may need to learn and to grow. Listen to understand, then speak. So don't just listen um, to respond, but to really understand their perspective. Build the relationship first. I think this is incredibly important. Um, I think it was Brooke who said that trust was really important when having um, difficult conversations. And I think that is extremely true because trust allows um, for us to know that we are entering the conversation and that you don't have ill intent towards me and that we really just want to both grow. So ask questions. Um, this is um, a two-sided thing as well where you know, we can ask questions to help other people self-reflect, to dig deeper um, um, in how their beliefs and what they really think and just really dig deeper into that. But on the other hand, askers should be thoughtful about how and what they ask um, as to not objectify or often targeted. So sometimes um, asking questions can be great but then other times it can also be disrespectful. So just be really mindful of what you're asking um, and how it could possibly be received. Um, lean in and try it. Reflect and try again. This is ongoing work. I think this is probably one of the most important um, ones that it will not, by attending this training, all your problems will not be solved, but you will have very helpful tools the next time you enter the conversations. And then you can be cognizant as you have another important conversation. After it's done, you can reflect and each time um, growth happens. So leave if it's not a real dialogue or could be harmful. Be aware of your boundaries. Um, and if the dialogue is not productive for you or you feel that it's harmful, um, if you are able, you should probably leave that. Frame the issue with a person's self-interest in mind, develop empathy, and lastly, use facts and narratives. So these are all just tips that we find to be incredibly helpful as we enter um, conversations around identity um, and value. <laughs> Can I add something really quick about the facts and narrative too? I think that one is really yeah. interesting and important because um, what we've found kind of over the years now is that there's a lot of facts that are really key and important, but there's also a lot of weird, well, I would define it as weird, mm -hmm. um, kind of like pushback on facts these days. <laughs> so knowing your facts is really important and being well educated, but sometimes also a good narrative, a good story that will counter stereotypes that will prove your point really connects to people's mm -hmm. mind and heart so they can visualize those facts. So I think it is great to like have both of those in your back pocket to to create um, mm -hmm. better examples um, to show your thoughts. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, and if anyone has any questions or any comments, please feel free again to populate that chat. Um, and now we will go into the respect code revisited. So as you know, we had a respect code um, at the beginning. And so um, just to revisit the respect code, um, we highly encourage um, when you have these conversations to develop a respect code. It doesn't have to be as formal as the slide that we presented, um, but we think it's always important to develop boundaries um, as you enter conversations. So. Um, 
asking that the person that you're having a conversation with doesn't use hate language or slurs, or um, if you're in a smaller group, um, allow people the right to pass. I think by developing um, a respect code, um, everybody is on the same page as to how they would like to be treated um, and what boundaries they would like to have during these conversations. Claire, do you have anything? No, it's, to add? I mean, I think the only thing that's been really interesting the last couple of times we've facilitated this, um, trying to visualize and hearing people's experiences of using them on like one on one conversations where they're just like talking to someone and they're like, well, how I'm not going to like get a piece of paper and write a code down. But what they what they explain they do is they say, like, especially with someone they have repeat challenges conversating with. They'll just be like, hey, so usually when we get into a conversation about things like this, um, you know, we end up just getting really mad and running out of the room. Can we this time make sure we don't interrupt each other? Because I always get really upset when we always get end up interrupting each other and both of us get more angry. Or, you know, can you please make sure mm -hmm. that, um, you know, let's just try to be calm and really listen to each other this time. You know, so just I'll do it in like casual mm -hmm. ways. And so that was something I hadn't really fully thought of before that I, I've been wanting to try out. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. Um, that is something we have heard a lot like, well, I don't want to have a formal thing. And I think that respect codes don't always have to be written. Sometimes they can be verbal. Um, but I think the most important thing is that um, you remember what your respect code is. And so that way you can keep um, all the people involved in the conversation accountable to the boundaries mm -hmm. you established. So now we will be going on to NPR's Code Switch. And um, Claire, if you want to introduce yeah. that video, that can give Kinsey time to- For sure. I don't know if any of you ever listened to the Code Switch podcast. Um, it's, it's out of NPR and it talks a lot about race, ethnicity, and from a lot of different um, perspectives. It's so amazing at um, connecting to ongoing community societal issues as well as culture and connecting it to history and policy and politics um, in a very fun way. I always listen to it while I'm doing my weekend tours, <laughs> cleaning the house, and I learn so much. Um, <laughs> And so we really um, love them. And we found this video just on YouTube that we wanted to share with you because they specifically start to bridge this conversation into thinking about as we have conversations around equity, anti-racism, um, which is identity um, and how we as people can um, have different experiences around our identity. Um, we know that in our society right now, there's just been a lot, a lot of challenging conversations. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are from um, identities that have been, um, you know, dealing with marginalization, and oppression for decades have really been facing it um, lately. And uh, really a lot of people just share with us that they're very exhausted. And so it's important for us all to engage in conversation um, and to educate and to learn. And so we just want to um, think about that specifically as one of the kinds of conversations we're talking about today. And here's a couple tips from them. Yeah, so I'll yep. stop sharing my screen so Kinsey um, can share the video.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Kenzie. Um, so now I will turn my screen back on and we'll go over these tips. Oh, Claire, you're still muted. In the chat as well, if you all want to see those. Um, and I'm just curious too to know how what you all thought of the video and specifically which of these tips um, really stick out to you as useful. And maybe if someone's willing to put an eye in the chat, we could hear more about why. If you're not in the mood to talk with the group, then you could just um, share your why also in your message on the chat. Which one sticks out to you the most and maybe why? Someone else's, it looks like some people might be experiencing some delay. Um, would it be possible to put the link to the video in the chat as well? Mm -hmm. That way people can watch it later if they didn't get a chance to see it all. I can put that link in the chat. Okay. Sorry, Gary. So we hope that these are useful. They go along with a lot of the things we already mentioned. Um, and if you'd like to answer, oh great. Um, someone mentioned that something that was um, stood out for them was sitting back and not always speaking. That's hard for me. Me mm -hmm. too. Um, Especially about topics you're passionate about. I feel like that's one of the hardest things. Yes, I know yeah. one of my favorites is embrace discomfort, because I think that sometimes area of discomfort um, can lead to a lot of growth, especially about areas um, where I think my discomfort really stems from the fact that I don't know about a lot of things about certain topics um, by embracing this discomfort and being comfortable with not knowing everything. I think that allows me to be um, more humble and sit back um, and not always speak. Yeah, I really love ask questions. And it's one, I, I liked how you point out the um, complicatedness of asking questions. I think I think about that a lot as a white woman who's, you know, straight and middle class and has been given more advantage. Um, I love asking questions, but I also want to ask them in ways where I'm not creating harm. Um, I don't want to freeze and quit interacting. I want to embrace the discomfort. And one way I think that can be a good entree is asking questions. But also, mm -hmm. I like your points about how you ask questions. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's been a good space of reflection for me to think about. Okay, so quite a few people maybe are having a hard time um, unmuting. Mm -hmm. So thank yeah. you all for trying. And, and Mackenzie, thanks you're... for having me. Yes, thank you, Kenzie. And even if you're not able to unmute, we would love if you could populate the chat and we would be able to read um, and respond to your responses. Well, I think the next thing we're going to move into is just giving you some more space for self-reflection. Um, and, you know, this is not something you have to share, but it's also a great topic for conversation. If you do want to share aspects of it in the chat, feel free. Um, Oh, great. Thanks, Kenzie, for answering, too. Vulnerability. That's mm. a hard one. <laughs> yes. Um, so that kind of goes into this larger conversation we want you to have with yourself about where, just noticing, um, where are you comfortable and uncomfortable and having challenging conversations? And if you want to focus that on ones that pertain to issues of, you know, no, equity, race, racism, mm -hmm. um, on at any different level, feel free to, to think about that as well. So we'll just give you a minute or two to self-reflect. I know we live busy lives and sometimes just having a couple minutes of ours to ourselves to think is, is hard to do. So we will give you about three minutes. That means if you need to stretch while you're thinking or anything like that too, feel free. And um, we will turn our 
cameras back on or come back together to talk more and move forward after your self-reflection in about, um, what do you think would be good? I mean, about three minutes? Yeah, about two or three. And I will also um, put the critical conversations resource guide um, into the chat just in case anybody um, was not able to get it um, before um, the training started. Okay, so it is 645. I hope that you had a few minutes to um, answer this question. And okay, thank you so much, Vicki. Um, Vicki said that participants can't speak um, during the sessions. They can only use the chat and Q&A features to communicate. Oh. Only the speakers and hosts can speak. Thank you so much. Um, but, so if anyone has anything uh, to say, oh. please put it in the chat and we can be able to respond. Um, we hope that you were able to take this time to run to the bathroom, grab a drink if you needed, but also to answer this question um, because we feel that it's very important in terms of assessing your past, but also the future um, conversations that you'll have. So yeah. as we go and talk about um, and fully focus into addressing um, bias around identity, um, I think this quote is a really, really um, great point as we lead into these conversations, which is in 2016, researchers stumbled on a radical tactic for reducing another person's bigotry, a frank, brief conversation. Um, and Claire um, has, I would tell the story, but Claire tells it just way better than me. So Claire will give a little bit of context to um, how this quote came about. Yeah, I think I thought that was really interesting. My my coworker Mamie shared this article with me, um, and you know I think doing work talking about conflict, looking at all the different you know 
just bigotry that we were seeing in our society, it sometimes feels very futile trying to work against it. And I think a lot of people were getting exhausted and feeling hopeless. Um, but she shared this article with us and it was it was helpful um, because what it did is it showed how um, a group in Florida, Florida was going to try and pass some basically anti-transgender legislation, I think that was like housed around restroom use. Um, and so an LGBTQ organization and allies um, got together and decided to do a door knocking campaign. So talk about being vulnerable. They were going up to individuals' doors and just trying to have a brief, frank conversation with them about how that bill would hurt and harm people um, who are transgender and what it meant to to that community and family friends. And so, um, you know, they didn't know who was going to be on the other side of the door. They knew they would be voters. Um, and they went and had those conversations. And what they found was that a lot of people ended up connecting, learning, and able to empathize when when groups and individuals were humanized through their their conversation and that 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 information didn't just you know it wasn't just like a brief conversation at the door and then the door was shut and they were like yeah whatever but that actually translated to the to the polling place and um people voted to not pass to oppose that legislation um that was discriminating against transgender people um and or people who are transgender so that was really exciting to hear. Um, and then on reflecting, I'm just curious, you know, how many of you have had your minds changed or you've really um, learned from a, a, about identity, about someone else, about a different perspective from a brief conversation and it changed the way you saw things. I know that there have been those powerful moments in, in my life. So, um, so we wanna just encourage you and give you some hope that even though these conversations can be very hard um, and sometimes they don't move forward, there are other moments that do. Um, and, and we do do impact people with sharing our perspectives and, and being honest and having these brief, frank conversations. And with that being said, we do wanna give you some tools to have them though. So we've hopefully, hopefully the tips that we've given you earlier, they're very much grounded in social emotional learning and communication. Um, we touched a little bit about how those connect to race and conversations around that, but we also wanted to give you some tools about interrupting specifically bigotry, hate language, um, identity-based um, prejudice or bias that you hear come out of mouth sometimes, even if they're not people that you know. So um, we are going to share a, if you can check it out in the chat, it's a really cool pocket guide that Learning for Justice, who used to be called Teaching Tolerance Created as a part of a series of, of, of making schools places where kids are kids and adults are learning how to interrupt prejudice, bias, and hate. Um, and so they give some very specific ideas. So go ahead and open that up and take a look at it. I don't know if that's possible to share on the screen as well. Um, yeah, but they yeah give, I can share that. Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead and pull that up. Because um, we're going to utilize it, plus all the other strategies and ideas that we've talked about today, including others that we haven't maybe mentioned. Um, but the pocket guide gives some some concrete ideas. If you hear someone saying something hurtful or offensive, you know, their, their number one thing is you need to interrupt it. I need, yeah, go ahead. Um, that you need, sorry, my daughter's home with me. Um, you need to interrupt it. And so figuring out how to interrupt it is kind of the, the, the question. Um, so they give these other suggestions um, to accompany that concept of interruption, which is to create, use, use questions. That's a great way. Just start asking those questions that we've talked about before. Why do you say that? Hmm, what makes you think that? And then you could have more detailed questions as well. Um, educate, so give further information, knowledge, Maybe saying something like, do you recognize the his history of that word? Could be your question. And then you can bring the education in. Oh, because blah, 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 blah. Um, and then also echo. If there is someone that's brave enough in a space to speak up about a problematic situation, comment, then um, echoing and supporting that person, thanking them for speaking up, um, and also seconding it to kind of to help support them and make people know it's not acceptable and that person is not alone in thinking that. So just keep those in mind. Um, and what we're gonna do next is we're gonna
play a couple different scenarios for you. Um, Learning for Justice, the, the videos will show, um, they work with teachers frequently and educators. And so we're gonna show a couple of scenarios where um, these educators were cough, caught off guard in a situation and, and they were just like, I didn't know what to say. Um, and I don't know if we could see your hands. I bet you all have been in situations like that before. Um, I know I have, you know, whether it's in your workplace, when, when uh, you're just riding the bus or walking somewhere in line at the grocery store with family members, um, you know, it could be anywhere. And so um, practicing these different strategies is something that we think can help. Even just thinking them through to build our neural pathways so that we can react in a helpful way in situations where we might be under stress or um, surprised by, by what someone else says that could be hurtful. All right. So we'll show it. If we could show each one twice, that would be really mm -hmm. great because they go they go by pretty quickly. And we are going to invite everyone to participate in the chat. It's kind of just saying, you know, what, how, how could they react? What could they do? Um, and if you want, you can just start with using that that um, speak up pocket card or anything we've mentioned in the workshop today. Okay, so hopefully everyone has seen that. And go ahead and just throw in the chat, what, what, what would you use to interrupt that situation? What could you do? What could you say? So I think Claire has accidentally left, um, but um, Kinsey's will play this one more time and as she plays it, hopefully you'll be able to formulate thoughts. Um, and then I will get into the nitty gritty of how could you possibly respond to it. So thank you, Kinsey. Um, so, um, I, while that is loading, um, I would just be curious to see, um, what people could say to that, um, situation. I will put the link to the YouTube video in the chat, um, if you haven't been able to see it, but what are possible ways using that speak up card that we also shared with you, what are possible ways that we could respond to this situation? Hi, Claire. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I disappeared. I don't know what happened. Yeah, so Kinsey put um, educate. Um, do you know the history of that word? Vicky put, we. she could have said that is not a word we use in my classroom. Interrupt. I don't like words like that. I think that especially it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation that using echo um, isn't necessarily a possibility in this situation, but the interrupt and educate, I think combined could be very powerful in this conversation. Can I add something, Alina, though? 
Yeah, um, I think for me though, it's it's interesting because to me the bigger issue is his mind frame mm. about why a kid with a disability wouldn't be able to work with his child. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think I wouldn't go in on the use of the R word first. I think mm -hmm. I would try to reach him somehow on the larger topic of like the worthiness and importance of having mm -hmm. um, like um, classrooms that have multi like different differences in learning styles and abilities and disabilities within them and like how enriching that is. Um, I think it's really easy and it's been hard for me to not caught, get caught up sometimes when people are using words that are hurtful, mm -hmm. but sometimes the background information is even uh, more important, but then eventually I would like to get to it as I think a lot of you are, are right on for saying, but that could just, I think maybe shut, shut that father down before we even address the real issue. Yeah. Ask, do they understand the word? I think that altogether, what I'm sort of gleaming is that there needs to be a larger conversation around ableism with the dad um, and analyzing ableism. Yeah. And maybe even just asking, I think I'd go for the question, like, what makes you um, concerned um, what makes you concerned about the situation? Mm -hmm. And then like trying to dig, are you, um, I don't know, just trying to kind of go from there, trying to listen and then, and then trying to ask really good questions and hoping that my brain could work fast enough to come up with them. Yeah. Ooh, I know a good one. Okay. Sorry. I thought of a good one. See, it always comes later. Um, how do you think um, the parent, cause it's a parent, right? So how do you yeah. think the parent? of this child would feel if they were not included in the classroom or allowed to participate and have this education. So, because I think he's there to advocate for his child as a parent, um, you know, having to help think, have him think through and have empathy for the parent of the child he's trying to get rid of, <laughs> maybe. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important um, one of the things that we mentioned in the um, tips was um, sort of centering that person. And I think it's important to not let one person's need um, be an encouragement of discrimination and oppression. But in that, you can talk to them about how it will be helpful for his son to have a diverse experience with his classmates. I think that also has to do another thing of dismantling um, ableism in the father. And I think showing that his son is getting a better education because he has a diverse range of classmates is something that's really important to um, bring up as well. Hmm. Awesome. Do yeah. we want to do another one? Yeah, did, so we'll do, <laughs> no, we'll do the, um, the second one. Um, and I think that one will also bring up some really excellent responses as well. to say. I overheard another teacher commenting to a student, the earrings uh, look a little ghetto. I didn't know what to say. Yeah, so what do you all think about that one? How could you approach that? And I'm sorry you, you can't use your mics because I know these are complicated, so it's hard to kind of just answer in a brief sentence sometimes. <laughs> Thanks, Beth, for joining us. Um, as we think about um, this Speak Up video, um, I think it's also important to analyze microaggressions and how microaggressions play a part in this um, conversation. Um, so I feel like that is an important aspect to consider as we think about how we could possibly respond to this teacher.
Alina, what do you think you would do? You've, uh, you've gotten a little extra time to think about it, y'all, because we've looked at these a couple times, but I feel like I learned something new every time. Yeah, so Ron said teachers should not be judgmental of the students. Um, and I definitely agree. I think if I was in that situation, um, the teacher in question um, would be pulled aside immediately to have a conversation. Um, one, about their views, what they equate with a ghetto. Um, and like Kinsey said in the chat, those questions and really digging deeper um, and trying to see where these beliefs come from, um, it becomes a lot harder um, to explain them um, once that those questions are being um, asked. And so I think asking those questions is really important. And I think that in no certain terms, it's something that has to be addressed immediately. As a teacher, um, teachers are gatekeepers. And so um, this teacher has a lot of responsibility and power in and out of the classroom. And so making sure that their st uh, student population is being treated um, with equity in mind is something that makes it an urgent situation. Mm -hmm. I loved it too in the in one of the earlier um, facilitations we did around this and used this same video, a teacher brought up that they would also make sure to come back and check in with the student who received that comment and say something encouraging to her, maybe a compliment around the earrings, but also would ask, you know, um, another person had said also that they would make sure she knew that that that's not acceptable for her to be treated like that by a teacher and that the the colleague was going to talk to her and address it so that she wouldn't say things to her like that again. Mm -hmm. I hope that made sense how I said it. But um, circling back to the student who received that um, that comment to make sure they were doing okay as well. I like that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and not only um, addressing the comments made by the teacher, but also showing support for the student. Because I think being on the uh, receiving end for microaggressions can make a person feel very lonely and isolated. So showing support for the student is also an important aspect of responding. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody else have a thought? We'll watch out for it in the chat. Looks like we have time for a couple more of the speak out videos. Should we keep going? Also, if any of you have a scenario that you are mm -hmm. curious to see what what we or perhaps some other participants would would do or say around it, mm -hmm. feel free to put it in the chat. And you don't, you know, you can say, you know, just don't use anybody's names. And it could also just be a hypothetical situation as well. And if you're mm -hmm. just curious about it. Um, something that you've experienced or have seen out there that you've you've wondered what you should have done or said. Um, feel free to share those in the chat. Um, in the meantime, let's go ahead and watch another one. Yeah, so Kinsey's loading them up. Mm. What would you do? What would you say? <laughs> it's a tricky one. I feel like I, I can already hear in my mind being dismissed for trying to say something. Maybe it's because my experiences as a high school student <laughs> and like trying to speak up to some things like that and then being made fun of for saying something or being like, ah, you know, like just being written off. Um, but I think as a teacher, maybe a question, maybe um, if I just go back to those teaching tolerance suggestions, maybe something like, do you, maybe a question that's almost sarcastic, like, do you really think that, I don't know, oh, I'm so glad, are you a doctor and you really understand the the role that PMS plays in a, a girl's ability to take notes? Interesting, tell me more about that. Or I don't know, something like that, where um, the per participant would have to maybe feel a little humbled or it wouldn't become like this very serious conversation that I don't know that could embarrass the girl more like it, it'd have to be done without embarrassing her more 
Anybody else have thoughts? Alina or Kenzie yeah. or anyone else? I mean, as we talk about having productive conversations and making sure not to be um, es have escalators, I think um, it's also important to have that reflection because I know if I was in this conversation, um, I would probably be a little more snarky, um, which might not be called for in the situation. So recognizing like what you would do um, is also helpful and realizing what you probably shouldn't do. Yeah, and, and maybe even too, just feigning super, like I think as a teacher before, just moving between students and catching things. Um, I don't know if it's, I've also just um, feigned confusion or like real, really innocence about it. Like, oh, huh, what do you mean by that? And then maybe he'll, he'll, the same thing with the previous question, start to try to explain that comment and get more confused and notice why they were being ignorant, kind of, for lack of a better word, or rude. Um, or it'd be interesting to do a hall chat and just be like, mm -hmm. hey, can I see you in the hall? Because then that way it doesn't put, put the girl he said that to on the spot more. And then mm -hmm. he won't be in front of a, a um, like a public space and there mm -hmm. won't be spectators. So it can really change the dynamic where maybe he would be able to listen and I could share something even in a more vulnerable way of like, you know, growing up a girl, it has always bothered me when people say things like that to me. And here's why. And just talk from my perspective versus um, assuming how the young woman felt who he made that comment to. Um, that's a thought too. And I just want to point out the comment in the chat too. Um, Sherry Fennell was mentioning just being brushed out or be, of being too too sensitive. Um, and that's a common mechanism that people use to try to shut people down when they're getting, they're trying to hold someone accountable for, mm -hmm. for being um, prejudiced or bigoted or ignorant in a way that they should, or ist, any of the isms. Um, it is, and I think it's a way for people to put the blame on the person that's holding them accountable instead of the actions and the, and the words um, that they use that hurt other people. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely, um, you know, agree with that sentiment that oftentimes it makes you reluctant to even try if you're just going to dismiss um, my concerns as just being too sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's where the echoing is a really powerful tool too, mm -hmm. um, to uplift the people who are speaking up so they don't just get easily dismissed. I think power in numbers is a really real thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the more that, that people can support and activate each other and be like, no, you're, you're not too sensitive. Like that's rude and you have no reason to be rude or, you know, however you want to put it, or that's ignorant and you, you need to do better. <laughs> yeah. I think it also allows people um, who are bystanders to know that that type of language um, or actions isn't tolerated in the environment. And so even mm -hmm. if people are too hesitant to speak up, they know that they have allies within um, the environment that this is taking place. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Because he made that comment in a public sphere, does the teacher need to say something publicly? Mm. I think I'm still going back for my first reaction. I'm really curious if people disagree with me too, because you know, there's no right or wrong real answer to a lot mm -hmm. of these, or they're they're hard to navigate sometimes because it's not like we get a playbook and you know each scenario is written out and we can just check it off. Um, but I think for me, the pull into the hallway would still suffice because they know, you know, maybe it'd be like, oh, hmm. I need to talk to you in the hallway, mm -hmm. you know, like a head nod. So there's like a sense of disapproval, mm -hmm. right? I think that's one of the things that is used in anti-bullying strategies too, is that you need to create a culture within your classroom or your school where that those things are not what's approved of. They're not normalized. And so um, I would want to show some kind of distaste, but not um, go into detail mm -hmm. um, in front of everyone. So trying to yeah. pull off that fine balance. 
I think that um, also ties into building the relationship. So having relationships with students that you can assess the situation um, and see how responding would fit in within the classroom culture. So maybe it's something where you need to um, pull the student out. Maybe it's something that you need to have a group conversation about. But I think a lot of times um, our responses to different conversations um, is very dependent on the people who are involved. Yeah. And I think there's something about proactive, too. Like, all of a sudden, I'm just, I'm wondering what you all in the audience are thinking about, too. Um, but I know I'm starting to go back and think about my personal experiences. And, like, were there times when, when um, myself or a classmate was targeted um, mm -hmm. by a hurtful comment? and the teacher did a great job of dealing with it, you know, or another person in the room like spoke up and how that made me feel. Or um, if I was able to do that successfully in the past and someone expressed it. Um, and I, yeah, I'm sure there's a litany of different things I can think of, but I do think about some of, some of the high school teachers I had were really good at noticing um, those kind of interactions that were going on socially within the school, the clubs even, and in their classrooms, and then purposely designing curriculum opportunities to tie it into our dialogue and create conversation around it. Not that, you know, the students who probably it was, you know, like we all needed to be a part of it. Um, and they picked really specific issues, I know, to address the relevance of some of the needs for learning that we had. like Kinsey's comment in the chat that you don't want to make the environment more uncomfortable for the female student but it's also important to let all the other students know that the PMSing comment is not acceptable language in that classroom or otherwise so I think it's um, you know a, a tight line that you have to walk into um, and it may not be the perfect response but by each instant um, where you do respond and you do have these conversations, we're able to learn from them, which I really think is um, the key for growth. Let's do, let's do one more. Yeah. Hmm. Thoughts on this one? Similar but different to others we've talked about. And we'll also put the link in the chat in case anybody wants to watch it again. Um, but I know that my first instinct um, is to interrupt um, and mitigate the harm that has occurred. And so just making sure that um, there is no more of that being done um, because it is one student that's being targeted. What about you, Claire? I don't know. Um, I think I think I would pull the, the person aside um, and have a real heart to heart conversation with them. I'd use like I statements and um, try to develop some empathy, but I, it would definitely not be in front of a public space. Um, but also, I think thinking about like in the moment, trying to interrupt it and just by um, by saying, I think I think that, you know, by don't just like saying, hey, we're not going to do that in this classroom. Like we treat everyone with kindness kind of thing, you know, like I would do with my daughter if she was doing something or, you know, we're not going to treat each other like that. That is unkind and rude and ridiculous. And so. <laughs> I think I just call it out kind of like that. And I think when you have different power dynamics, like teacher to student, um, and if I'm supposed to be managing the classroom, those kind of things are easier to do. That's harder to do something like that peer to peer, um, especially if I was the age of the student. And so I would also make sure to check in with the student who wears um, hearing aids and try to see how they're doing. And it would be really cool if he was interested in having a conversation with the kid who is taking 
fun of him mm -hmm. um, and see about what was going on. And once they had gotten an opportunity to talk, I feel like it's even important to loop in parents um, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. now that I am a parent, and I think about if my daughter was facing something like that at school, I would want to know how to support her from home. And mm -hmm. probably if it's very possible, she would not share that with me, I realize. Um, and so those are things that I really think about as a parent now. It's like, well, if everybody, if I imagine that each of these, uh, everybody's my kid, <laughs> and I'm just going to like, without trying to be paternalistic or gross, like just trying to really come from like what I want the best for them. And what does the best look like? Um, yeah, I just want to highlight Brooke's comment um, where she talks about that this was on a TikTok that recently went viral. And I don't know if anyone has else has seen that news story. Um, but I agree, like the classmates also not only interrupted um, the actions by it was a professor who was being very, very rude and not understanding um, to their deaf student. And the classmates did a great job, I think, in interrupting that moment um, and then echoing the person who was first con um, confronted. And so I think that is also, unfortunately, a real life situation where we see the um, speak up being um, enacted. But also Vicky um, posed a question in the chat and Claire, if you wanna tackle that. let's see here when you have a limited amount of time is it better to shut down the harmful behavior or ask a question dialogue how do you balance that i mean i think one thing you can do is a, try to formulate a question that should shut down the behavior um i think a great question that, and this is something i learned in like um teaching background is just like what are you doing right now what are you saying what do you mean by that where are you supposed to be you know, like kind of asking them some questions so they have to tune into themselves and start to self-reflect right away. And that tends to refocus and change the energy. And then, um, and so I think that those can go together hand in hand um, because depending on the situation, having a demonstrative reaction can escalate some someone. And it really just depends on the person and the situation. But um, I'm trying to think about like if it was with a peer or another adult who is being rude like that. Sometimes a look can shut someone down, <laughs> you know, like, but I think a look and a question can really help um, if you're trying to shut it down quickly. Um, and then making time later to circle back around for the really um, thoughtful conversation. As we're um, nearing the end of our training, um, I would just like um, to wrap up the content <laughs> of today. Um, but first acknowledging um, Kenzie's comment in the chat, um, which is in the video, the teacher mentioned that this student um, making that super ableist comment loves getting attention. That's no notable to me. Why is it, why is that student choosing to seek attention in that specific way? What insecurities might they need healing from themselves? Um, but to Vicky's point, being pressed for time can make this deep dive a bit of a challenge. And I think Kinsey's comment is very, very incredible and hits it right on the nose is that a lot of the times um, these actions and misbehavior that are me centered so bringing like the intention back to me um can be a cover for um deeper rooted issues whether it be like insecurity or they're acting out because of outside factors out of school factors um so i think it's important to mitigate that harm interrupt it educate um, but also when asking questions about digging deeper, I think um, part of that has to do with social emotional learning um, and analyzing what's going on with that student in particular. Um, so thank you so much to everybody who commented and responded. And I hope that having that these outside um, situations can help you to analyze um, different ways of responding to critical conversations. And so as we um, wrap up a little bit early, um, we just wanna know 
what have you learned today? Um, are there any lingering questions? Um, especially as we enter our Q&A mode, if you have any questions um, about this training in particular, about Peace Learning Center, about anything, we would be very happy to answer them. And also, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to put an evaluation um, in the chat. So if you could fill that out, we would absolutely love that. We'd love to get feedbacks about our different trainings. Um, so I open it the floor to um, all the participants. If there's any questions that you would like to ask us, um, ask away. And Claire, I didn't know if you had anything you would like to add. Appreciate um, you all for being here. For those of you, you know, who who added to the chat, uh, it's always great to hear your perspectives. I'm sorry um, we couldn't hear from you more um, and see your beautiful faces. Um, but it was really great to be here with you and share this information. And I just really hope it's helpful in whatever capacity for you in your life and for interrupting, you know, bias, hate, prejudice, ignorance, and bigotry. Um, the ongoing process. And we're all trying to find ways that we can do it. And, and I think it does take um, a lot of bravery in some situations. And I, I know for me, I really, um, my greatest goal is to not to cause harm. And so I've really embraced the concept that not taking action is also causing harm. Um, and so I need to find a way to do something um, and do my best at it. And if it's coming from my heart, if I do it imperfectly, I hope that I can mitigate that harm. Um, because I know there's harm in not speaking to. So those are just some things that I'm kicking around and I really appreciate um, getting to be with you all today. It would have been great to hear the voices of the participants. Highly agree, <laughs> highly agree. Um, it was a little weird doing it without hearing people, but we are incredibly thankful um, to be able to receive at least written, <laughs> written engagement. And I just unmuted. Are you guys able to hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, perfectly. I just wanted to um, voice that if anyone has any questions that you would like um, asked aloud, I'm here and I'm able to unmute myself and I can kind of verbally convey that to Alina and Claire. But if I may ask a question myself, that's kind of been at the back of my mind. Um, so how do we create space for critical conversations in virtual landscapes specifically? Mm. What are some of the difficulties and how can we overcome those difficulties? Because I'm just thinking about the countless horror stories I've heard of people hacking into Zoom classrooms mm. and having hateful images appear on video or, you know, displaying hateful rhetoric. And even people who don't have to hack the Zoom classrooms because they're doing this towards their classmates and they know that accountability is extremely limited. I mean, one of the biggest mechanisms for accountability can be the host being able to mute people and cut them off. But since we can't do that in in person and because that's not even healthy virtually, what can we do to hold people accountable for um, compassionate dialogue when we are in a virtual landscape? Things are awkward. It's more difficult to regulate conversation in <laughs> a variety of ways. Um I, th I think for me, it goes back to what Alina presented on, which is our um, respect code, mm -hmm. our agreements for peace. So thank you all for following those today. Um, but I, I, I also participate in an ongoing um, project through Spirit in Place called Powerful Conversations on Race. And those were in person. I'm about to, those are going to start again um, in the Zoom world. So that will be interesting. But they're open to anyone. Um, you know, so anyone could come in the door and we've had situations that have escalated and been awkward, um, you know, but generally what we found really, really helped is the same things we practice with Peace Learning Center, which is creating a great container for it where people are clear of the objective and what's going to happen and how this is a unique conversation, as well as really having that respect code and going over that. So if people are not following that agreement that we made at the beginning, then we can ask, we can address it as facilitators, we can acknowledge that, and that stands true on Zoom. Um, I think the hardest thing is just like situations like this or situations where people don't participate whatsoever and are not present. 
Um, we, we, I have never experienced something where we've ever been like Zoom bombed or anyone's even like, you know, I think disengagement is more like a passive form, um, not with you all, of course, but like in other settings where we were experiencing resistance, it came more in like disengagement and, you know, so then like aggressive attacks. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But I think also, like you're saying, the ability to remove people, to mute, um, or, and just to like, Communally, like remind them that hey, this is not the space for that. We have these agreements that's going against our agreements. If you are not ready to be a part of this dialogue and follow those, then we invite you to come back another time when you are. How about you, Alina? What's your take on that? You're our tech guru. <laughs> yeah. So I think one aspect of um, it is just making sure that the environment is accessible as possible. So that may be including captions, making sure interpreters there, making sure that everybody has a seat at the table to have conversations and that they're accommodated for. So that's um, the first thing. The second thing I feel the most important part is engagement um, and making sure that people are engaged. And so if we're on Zoom, that means usually like being able to see people, being able to hear them. And it's a very fine line of like wanting to know that people are there and they're willing to really have these conversations, but also acknowledging that like there are many, many different outside factors that affect our lives as we are in this virtual space. We have kids, we have pets, we have coffee that we have to go run and get like a million different things. Um, so just making sure that people are engaged in an accommodating way um, so that you have people who are truly involved in the conversation. So I find that disengagement is probably one of the biggest problems that we run through, not just in conversations, but um, as trainers as well. So thank you so much, Kinsey. Um, if there are any other questions, we would be more than happy to answer them. We yeah, still I, have a bunch of time left. I just threw something in the chat to kind of going back to tips on engaging and creating these spaces, even in Zoom, is that I think it's really amazing to have a partner um, versus facilitating alone. And as best practices for a lot of um, specifically racial equity work, but I think other forms of equity, it's really great to have a, a diverse pair, whether that's multiracial, or if you were talking about gender and sexuality, maybe, you know, a team that um, someone who identified, they identified as different genders and potentially like sexualities. Um, but thinking about how that relates to the general power dynamic that could be at play and the different people who might be there and what they might bring up or need and so that you can support each other and the group in addressing those different aspects from your own lived perspectives um not that everybody's the same but at least there might be some shared commonalities um that can be supported or diversified um and humanized and also just like really preparing so if you are nervous about like what if people could like jump in here and do something crazy like that and hurtful then how can we interrupt that and how can we use our technology and having a plan in place so that the facilitators and the people there can feel more comfortable and grounded and that's another thing too i didn't think of is that a lot of the practices um even on zoom we've been incorporating um some deep breathing activities and kind of like having a good opening and welcoming, you know, a connection. Um, and then when we leave, giving some time and space for me for answering questions. And then before everyone leaves the space, taking some deep breaths and thanking everyone, um, you know, things like that help kind of like humanize and make the Zoom space feel more personal. Um, so I think those also contribute in this weird world of robots graphics <laughs> that we're all in. I think that's a great point. I added in the chat that like you can have passcodes, require participants um, to register. So these are all just like um, virtual sort of settings that we can add to sort of prevent the idea of Zoom bombing. But I think even more so that like harder resistance is really um, what's more difficult than that like upfront resistance is the disengagement. 
um, which is what I think <laughs> Kinsey I is getting at when she asks, how do we get people who are unwilling to have these conversations into spaces like this? Um, I may be wrong, but I feel like many of the people who self-select into talks like these already have a foundational awareness of the, the issues and a desire to grow. And I think that's a great point. Yeah. I think, I feel like the only times we're kind of not in situations like that as facilitators with Peace Learning Center is when we are brought into a large workspace um, that is, and then our programming is mandated. So, you know, we'll work with um, an organization, institution, whether it's a, a school or a university or a healthcare profession or, you know, um, an advertising agency, a nonprofit. And then, you know, everyone is mandated to go to that training. So it's not necessarily because they've had their own buy-in. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sometimes where we feel um, and experience some more resistance. And we're more likely to bring in folks who wouldn't have already just signed up for this activity or this conversation or dialogue. Um, and I, yeah, it's something that other people have been bringing up is like, how do we actually engage with folks on this deeper level who we wouldn't usually engage with? Um, or don't share the same perspectives. One thing that I don't know about, but I know that some people in like faith-based spaces have, have been bringing whatever conversations need to happen around race, equity, and identity in some different ways to their faith-based space. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe even building on some kind of shared commonality. So maybe our you know, church of this specific background, our temple would go up and meet with another temple from a different situation and we would have a dialogue together and the people who are, who are there want to all be there, but they're specifically there because they're from different backgrounds. Um, so I know that there are some, some aspects like that where people are in dialogue and kind of community. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of times we run into situations where people are voluntold to be a part of conversations. And so they come into this space thinking that, oh, this is professional development. I really don't wanna be here. Um, and so that is an obstacle. Um, but one thing I really like to do is just to get buy-in when having these conversations. So how does this conversation benefit you, the work you do, and where you are in your life? So for instance, um, if a nonprofit came in um, and wanted to talk about critical conversations within their workspace, you know? So how do we make critical conversations and how do we apply this to your life and make it benefit your workplace? We want your workplace to be better because of this. And so I think that um, one of the tips that we go back is sort of framing the issue with the person's self-interest in mind. Um, and I think that there's a fine line in um, acknowledging the person's self-interest, but not making that like the center of the conversation. But I think that at least acknowledging the self-interest part um, is really important to get buy-in because then people are able to visualize how this particular topic affects their life um, in particular, instead of seeing it as sort of like this outside thing that doesn't really have anything to do with them. One other approach that comes to mind too is um, I was listening to NPR the other night and they were interviewing um, two friends on a college campus. One of them was um, part of like the young Republicans and the other one was part of like, a, the, I guess the young Democrats. And um, they were talking about their ability to get along and share some specific differences, but also identify where their similarities lied. Um, and so that was shocking for me because I think right now, generally in society, and maybe that's not true, but a lot of people from different perspectives are observant of the fact that we have conflict going on based off of our bad values based differences, right? Um, they even call it like culture wars sometimes, which I, I'm not a fan of that term, but it's widely acknowledged. So I think it might be an interesting place to be is if you could find a group where you're like, okay, here's the specific way we openly have different beliefs. What about us coming together and trying to talk about it in, you know, some kind of formalized way? I think it would be pretty interesting. Um, but I actually have never been a part of specifically that. It just more happens like in my school or something like that. Na random neighborhood moments or the, the staff lounge. <laughs> that 
we especially in the realm of equity that more and more we have been seeing um, more buy-in because of the events of the summer of 2020 um, with the murder of George Floyd and sort of, I don't want to say resurgence because Black Lives Matter has always been important and has always been a movement. But I think last summer, um, we really saw a difference in organizations and individuals really making an effort to learn about equity and anti-racism. And so I think that has also made it a lot easier to have these conversations and to have people who were previously maybe not uninterested, but sort of unaware or um believe that they weren't affected by these issues, um, now suddenly willing to engage and willing to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions for us, Mackenzie? Or if any other participants have questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Well, no more come to mind on my end, but you guys' responses were so comprehensive and so insightful that I appreciate you taking the time to share your responses and then also weaving in personal anecdotes too, just emphasizing the importance of bringing your full authentic self and your narratives and your own vulnerability to the table in every critical conversation. Um, so I thank you. Yeah. So if anyone wants to learn more about how to bring you two or your or your colleagues into their workspaces, uh, spaces of fellow living and learning, how can they reach you? I can drop that info in the chat. Yeah, so um, Claire just dropped the link to Peace Learning Center um, in the chat and um, sort of one <laughs> of the big banners on Peace Learning Center um, is that if you're interested um, in training for um, Peace Learning Center to contact Jay Haran um, at Peace Learning Center. And I just put her email in the chat. She is the point person um, for starting those conversations on what your organization could possibly need um, and how to get that process started of PLC facilitating a conversation. Thanks so much, everyone. Can I end us with like some deep breaths? I love that. Um, I've, I've invited all of you to, you know, share and really think and reflect about some challenges and challenging conversations, things that, that could have not gone well, made you feel vulnerable, humble, or even hurt. And so I think it's a good time before you go off into the rest of your evening to just take a minute to send our communities, ourselves, power, since we're at neighbor power, and also love. Um, so let's just release some of that tension that could have been there in our body because we don't want to harm ourselves in, in carrying that with us for the rest of our night or day tomorrow. So let's go ahead and take a deep breath in and exhale it out. Bring your shoulders up and take a deep breath in. Just notice your body and where you might hold tension and release it all in your breath out. <sighs> thank you so much for being here and thank you for participating in your community. Yeah. We would like to thank everybody. We know we're ending a little earlier, um, but we would just like to thank um, the participants. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you to Neighbor Power Indy um, and Maury at INRC for having us here. And a huge, huge, huge thank you for um, Mackenzie Isaac for being a wonderful, wonderful host and um, helping us to facilitate this. So I hope everybody has a restful and lovely, lovely evening. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Good night. Buenas noches. <laughs>